Hey everybody, welcome back to Monroe Live. Today we have Kevin and myself, I'm Corey. Um, this is the R1S. We're gonna do the hoist review today. And the reason why it's all dirty is because I live on a dirt road and I took it over Thanksgiving break. Um, I like the way this thing handled better than the R1T, most likely because of the wheelbase and the functionality. I have three children, so yeah. I got multiple car seats still in this, but Kevin and I are gonna go over the suspension and anything that's different. And from our first pass, we think it's pretty much identical to the R1T. So, uh, Eric, you wanna come in here and we can show you some of the architecture here. So the rear cradle is the first thing we're gonna focus on right here. It has these two large castings. You see the casting extends from this point all the way up here, back uh, to here. And then the horseshoes and, rearward. Yep. And, and then, and then you have uh, its cross car connected by an extrusion here, another casting, essentially a mirror image, and then an extrusion in the front. This is a relatively common method of creating cradles. See them in a lot of BMWs and Land yeah. Rovers. Um, using aluminum is expensive, but you get a big weight benefit. And with the castings on the side, you can get a lot of features built in to a singular part. So they have the mounting provision for this lower arm, the mounting provision for this more of a trailing arm. And Kevin and I were kind of joking when we went over and looked at the R1T parts laying on a rack, I said, man, this looks expensive. And what we mean by expensive is they're using some of the highest quality manufacturing methods. These are, these are forged components right here. One, two, three. And you can see a telltale forging line right there and right here. So that uh, a wrench would be forged. Have you ever used a, an old Craftsman wrench? You typically have the forging line on the side. And um, there's different methods of forging. I don't know exactly which ones these are, but you typically have a semi-solid forge. Yeah. Malfunction. My, my battery died. All right. A few moments later. So Rivian spared very little expense when it comes to their suspension system. It's essentially the opposite of what you would see in a low-end Japanese uh, sedan. A low-end Japanese sedan would have stamped steel components everywhere. Mm -hmm. They'd have a stamped steel cradle. They'd have a spring and a gas shock. This thing is like amazing. Now, Kevin, you wanna walk through the type of materials and choices they made and as well as the air suspension. Yeah, sure. So, you know, obviously here you can see What's pretty novel about this is that it's an, it's an air over hydraulic setup. So um, one of the big differences is from a system perspective, there's, there's no sway bars that control the vehicle roll with the system itself. So there is some like component reduction that's happening there, um, you know, across the vehicle, but so you do get the added benefits of the, the ability to control each wheel independently, you know, with the system and that complexity, at least they were able to get out the sway bar components uh, across the vehicle. Um, so that's, so that we do like, you know, from that perspective, there's obviously a lot of complexity here. But um, as Corey was kind of discussing, you have a forged lower, there's a series of multi-links here. You can kind of come down. This is where the, the spring itself is sitting on. And then the knuckle comes down here. There's kind of a trailing arm that comes up. And then we have a, another forged fork where this, uh, the dampener for the rear suspension sits. And then there's two more links. And then you can see their parting lines on all of them. And that one's actually pretty clean if you get in there and see it, Eric, but you know, all forgings. Um, a lot, most of the, the call outs for this, if you can see here, kind of like the plaid made in China. Um, so that does help keep some of the cost down on this itself, but um, it is a, a very expensive execution, but a very premium execution as well, as far as the forgings yeah. and castings and, and what they've kind of decided to, to bring to bear here. Yeah, and this vehicle has an amazing ground clearance. I believe it's 15 inches of ground clearance. I believe so. I think yeah. it's like somewhere in the realm of like eight inches of travel. Don't quote me on that, but it's it's very high. Oh, eight inches of travel. Yeah. yeah. And what you can see it just up on the hoist, how low the suspension hangs down. Yeah. And that's enabled by the position of this point further inboard than you'd have in a typical vehicle. So in a typical vehicle, this would be further outboard, I'd say four, six inches, maybe three, four, five inches more outboard. And what this allows you to do is it gives you a bigger moment arm um, so that the circle is larger. So the radius being longer means that you don't have as a dramatic of a tilt of the wheel 
uh, when it comes down. So if this was even further, it, the wheel would stay straighter up. Yep. So it's all about geometry mm -hmm. and being able to have the wheel drop and not actually swing in based on all the connection points of your upper, your lower, and the trailing. Um, so I'm not a suspension engineer, uh, but one thing I do know is that the further inboard you can get yeah. this, uh, the better the geometry is for going going really high up and really yeah. low. Yeah, essentially that's the only way you get travel on like an independent rear or independent front suspension, you know. And there's only so much you can do as far as bringing with these battery monuments inboard, but if you saw, and we had some like customer here with some more off-road focused vehicles, and that was a conversation of how far inboard could you pack it up package yeah. a motor and drive line and yet have control arms that were coming in very very um yeah very far inboard if you ever saw like a pre-runner truck or any of those trucks that have like you know 20 inches of suspension travel essentially their control arms are like almost on the center line of the frame themselves and they kind of reach out to get travel and uh yeah another important enabler is the powertrain setup so if you had an offset powertrain setup so eric you want to come in here it would be very difficult to have this level of articulation in the suspension but Rivians have quad motors with a centered uh, output, meaning the left and the right, or the left and the right CV axles are at the very same spot, and they're very long. And having a short CV axle also uh, limits your articulation of your suspension, particularly for in the front for steering, as well as in the rear. So these are long. You can see here to here, it's gotta be, I don't know, foot and a half, you know, pretty long. And uh, other OEMs, if they have one single large motor and it's offset, you'll actually have one short, they'll both be short, but then there'll be a transfer shaft. So having them in the center enables maximum length and equal length on both. Uh, something that's very important. We want to thank Anchor for sponsoring Monroe Live. They provided us with their GAN Prime line of products. Now what is GAN Prime? GAN is gallium nitride, and what does that mean? That means you get more power, more wattage in a smaller package. Our team makes sure that when we tear this product down, the 727 charging station, they're using high quality components intended to last for a long time. You can see the GAN chips right here. So you have one, two. GAN technology will soon be prevalent in inverters for power converting in electric vehicles, but it's not yet out there. So if you want to learn a little bit more about high-end technology, look at gallium nitride. So if you want a premium replacement for your charging needs, consider Anchor. Yeah, and you don't have to worry about like kind of the, the torque biasing issues nearly as much either, you know. Uh, on independent rear vehicles, you often would see on like more high performance applications, maybe a solid small diameter shaft on one side and then a hollow larger diameter shaft where they're trying to balance out some of the torque inputs to the rear of the vehicle, um, where this is um, the rear mirrored. The usually in the front for front well, wheel drive. Yeah, yeah, but on like, I, I'm referencing like, like the Camaro, oh, for yeah. instance, you know, you'll see, you know, yeah. a lot of these vehicles where they're, they're offset one shaft specifically to help keep the vehicle planted uh, under oh, yeah. acceleration. But, uh, but everything about this is, is very neatly packaged and set up where the motors are are forward and inboard, the weight is going in, um, yeah, in why, front of the axles. Why so have Mustangs nice. always struggle with that, Kevin? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <Sourced. cost>. um, <laughs> so, Sorry, Kevin used no. to drive a Mustang. Yeah. So. I'm trying to get another one back. But, um, but yeah, it's overall, it's, it's very interesting. The biggest, honestly, the biggest difference that I'm seeing here between the R1T that we have and the R1S is essentially like just the quality check marks. You know, um, ours has marks on some of the welds, but this, Whoever's gone through this has gone through some effort to go through and physically show that they have checked. We have, it, yeah. um, they're kind of bracketing these, each one of these welds, and they've been checked with you know a green mark, and then another they're coming through two with different, a blue. Two checks, two different color marks. Yes. Um, and typically, you know, it's almost like a, a drafting document, and you can kind of see on the side where they have some, they're calling out clean welds and things of that nature yeah. coming through. So Weld checked right there. Um, that's interesting because ours doesn't have it. Um, I don't know what our VIN is for our R1T that we tore down, it, it, but this is an early R1S, a very early one. I think ours did have not this extensive checks. No, it had it had some blue dots, I thought. Yep. So to see there's a blue dot right there. 
So you see blue dots, light green, and dark green. So this is clearly something that's important to them, yep. is, is weld quality. And you can see there's also weld quality checks on the brackets that mount to the powertrain. Blue dots and multiple colors of green. I, I've never seen essentially like this type of check uh, done before. Well, you'll see ah. on the control arms where they're, you know, they, they hash through some of these fasteners. That's very common, but something where they're going through and bracketing this, I, I've never seen it. They may have changed ah. the process. They may have some concerns with something. But um, that's the biggest difference I've I, seen between I just ours. noticed something. Go Maybe ahead. came to a conclusion. Look in here, Eric. You can see there is a certain green color mark on that fitting right there. That green paint on those two uh, fittings right here and here matches this. So you could have light green could be from the supplier, uh -huh. and then the dark green could be at the plant level. Yep. And so you again. could be double checking. Um, and that's know, not some, uncommon on early Sometimes, vehicles. yeah, especially this is very early build. This is VIN number 00140. So you, typically they start with 001, yeah. right? So for an R1S, this is most likely one of the first 500 built. You never know what order they build sure. them in. And um, so uh, we spent a lot of time on the rear suspension. Uh, we also want to focus on the, this CFRP, so carbon fiber reinforced plastic. And this is how the BMW i3 was made. So we, you can tell by the, the resin here. So it's typically about 45 to 55% woven carbon fiber mat. And then they, they form it and put it in a mold. And then they shoot essentially like a resin and epoxy mm -hmm. into the mold. And then the semi-transparent color here is thickening of the actual resin. Uh, this is a really robust uh, protective piece. There's one on the rear and I think two on the rear. There's yeah. one here and there's another one that we took off so that we could see in here. And um, this is, Kevin, is this, isn't this a package you can buy? I believe it is, yeah. And you can see here, like, uh, if you were to look at it, there's kind of a difference between the way that the, the resin is, is flowing through here. For this comp component, it's, it's not a big deal. Um, you know, it's not a class A component, but if this was like a hood, like on a Corvette or something like that, it'd be kicked back. Like when you look at the difference of the resin infills here, you can fall through here. So there's resin pulling there and then there's not. Now you can use resin like this, like on the BMW i3, as Corey mentioned, there's all sorts of like really cool resin channels that they put into that to guide wiring features. So you can do this very deliberately, but this doesn't seem to be that deliberate. It could just be a mild, you know, resin flow issue uh, that they might be having. But composites are cool, but they are expensive. But they're very well suited for kind of low volume applications. So this vehicle has a shorter wheelbase than the R1T. I believe it's 121 inches versus 135.8. And a lot of that's made up essentially right here. I think they shrink it. Uh, the R1T had more space here for a bigger battery. Mm -hmm. And this has 128.9 kilowatt hour battery. So still decent range. I never had it fully charged up. I was in like 220, 250 miles of range. I only had to go charge once over the weekend and I charged at my house, you know, with, yeah. the, with the low charge, but plenty of space for a decent battery to get 316 miles of range. And the battery itself, uh, you can see they have a protective panel here on this. You see this? It looks like a another either carbon fiber or yeah i believe for the yeah. battery close out yeah itself. i find it very interesting that there's essentially like we like extrusions i think i've probably said that phrase you know 30 times at this point that we like them they're, they're cheap to tool up for you can do a lot of complex you know shapes within them but i find it very interesting that there's essentially two completely different strategies between the front and rear um suspension on this vehicle as if there was I would argue it's probably timing that does a lot of that stuff. Timing for different things have changed, but the fact that there, when I looked through here, there's a lot of key places where you'd want a casting, but you know, all this, all this weld, especially, you know, stack ups of weld here causes a lot of heat introduction to the system. Uh, there's just, it, I find it very interesting that we don't see the same level of casting integration in the front that we do in the rear, because I'm not seeing anything, um, about the current product portfolio, um, 
that would suggest that they want to stay with something where they have a lot of flexibility to swap you know, comp components out. But it is, it's a lot of fixed strain, and it's a lot of welding that's going in the front of this, um, this cradle. So from a capital perspective, it's, it's very cheap as far as getting these, these components made through the extrusions, but the fixturing and assembly and manufacturing process is you know, vastly more expensive than the rear. So yeah. um, it's, it's one of the most interesting things about this vehicle is the difference between the front and rear suspension as far as the cradle uh, manufacturing strategies. And the, my main takeaway from this Rivian, this R1S, is starting at a base price of $91,000, going up to probably over $100,000, you are getting that much money worth of vehicle. And mm. what I mean you're getting that much money worth of vehicle, Monroe and Associates makes our living off of doing cost analysis, reverse engineering of, I mean, dozens, sure. hundreds of vehicles over the past you know, two decades. Kevin and I have seen hundreds, right. hundreds of vehicles. And if you blindfolded me and walked me under here and said, what vehicle are you under? And you, you know, moved me into the future. I'd say this is a high-end electric Range Rover from the future. Yeah. Like this is what I would expect from a premium, a premium suspension component, uh, max off-road capability. Clearly, I'd know it was electric, and even the brakes are just gigantic, yeah. totally overkill. If Rivian was just focused on making money, you would have a basic, uh, basic brake caliper, cast iron, not this massive. Fixed aluminum caliper. Fixed aluminum yeah. caliper. This is what you'd see on a Ferrari. Look how big it is. What is it, a six piston? One, two, three, four, five, six? Yeah, it looks like six. My goodness. Yeah, I mean, obviously, from a, it is a performance focused vehicle. Um, you know, this is a vehicle that could probably take on, you know, your, your Raptors, your TRXs, and things like that off road, and then come on road and start, you know, putting times down against like a Porsche or some other more road focused, you know, vehicles, at least in the, the SUV segment where you have some like the Macan or like a Jeep uh, Trackhawk or something like that, where you have um, an SUV platform that's migrated to more of a performance oriented um, vehicle. But it's clear that you, you get a lot for your money. Um, I have some misgivings about, you know, the, the suspension being, you know, air over Hydraulic, I worry about these lines and some of their routing and some, some stuff in some off-road situations. Um, you know, personally, this gives it an unbelievable amount of capability, but I would be concerned about um, essentially you're relying on this technology to give you the capability and um, ride comfort off-road. But if you were to essentially lose a corner, because I believe the way the system is set up there, the, the hydraulics flow cross car across the vehicle, um, losing a corner would be detrimental off-road because uh, you got yourself into the situation with this technology and then getting yourself out of the situation without it would be potentially troublesome so mm, that's uh, a good point but overall it, it delivers obviously a lot of performance and it's a, a relatively good value for you yeah. <laughs> the customer for sure good so, value to say it nicely i guess um all right be because this was so similar to the r1t um you know maybe we couldn't couldn't go as in depth as we normally do, but yeah. if you want to learn a little bit more about this platform, we also have another video on the R1T, so you can watch this one, yep. R1T, or the R1S, and that about wraps it up for us, right, Kevin? Anything yeah, else? yeah, nope, that's all for me. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of time with this vehicle just in general, so we couldn't do yeah. a part layout or anything like that. So. Yeah, we want to thank Rivian for providing us press vehicle. You know, I think I drove it about 200 miles this weekend. Maybe Kevin, you can take it out today. <laughs> to lunch, maybe. <laughs> sign the form, yeah. Um, but thanks for watching Monroe Live. We really appreciate uh, you tuning in. Yeah. And Thank you very much. Bye.